<risa> ¿Todo bien? Son las dos en punto de la tarde y la puntualidad de Tactical Edge me encanta. ¿eh? Relojitos eh, ingleses somos nosotros. Ingleses completamente y nuestro invitado <risa> estuvo previo a, a comenzar en esta segunda parte del primer día de ciberseguridad Tactical Edge virtual. Y para mí es un placer saludar a nuestro siguiente conferencista, Edgar, realmente los temas. Y tú ahorita vas a hablar con él, vas a conversar con Maurice Haver de Estados Unidos, que es CEO y CISO en Vision Trust. CISO y CTO. Ok, además, imagínate los cargos que tiene. <ríe> tiene más de 25 años de experiencia en la industria de TIE y es autor de cuatro libros, Vectores de Ataque, Privilegiados, dos ediciones, Vectores de ataque de activos y vectores de ataque de identidad. Mori supervisa actualmente la estrategia de Division Trust para la gestión de accesos privilegiados y las soluciones de acceso remoto. Eh, realmente me encanta saludarlo, Edgar. Es tu invitado también de honor también para esta jornada de la tarde. Welcome, Mori. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure speaking to everyone today. Uh, thank you very much, Mori. Uh, looking forward to uh listen to your presentation what's 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 your presentation about today today's presentation is called privileged attack vectors building effective defense strategies against privileged attacks essentially attacks that use credentials or username and passwords to attack your organization cause disruption or steal data so what we want to talk about today is different strategies to protect against it and it's more than just a presentation It's more about what is really going on in the threat landscape, what's happening in organizations as a common theme, what are the different definitions of privileged access management that can help you. And when I say definitions, people look at it in different ways from protecting passwords to removing admin rights. And then we're going to talk about 10 steps to universal privilege management. And this is a pragmatic approach to actually solving these attack problems within an organization. Now, as the introduction stated, my name is Maureen Haber. I have the distinct title of being the CTO and CISO for Beyond Trust. This allows me to wear two very interesting hats. First, I oversee the strategy for the organization and the products that we make. And I'm also the CISO. I take care of our internal security and our cloud security for our cloud solutions. One of the reasons that this overlap is so important is because I take the products that we design and manufacture and implement them internally. I drink our own champagne. So I have real world experience with using the products that we make, how effective they are, and the examples that they help people understand when trying to actually deploy them. Most importantly, I'm an author. I write regularly on Forbes, Secure World, and a variety of other places. I have two editions of Privileged Attack Vectors. The diagram, the book covers are on the uh, screen in front of you. And I'm really gonna be speaking about the second edition in this presentation which is a summary of the theory and problems that we all experience in trying to solve credential theft problems. So let's go ahead and get started. The privileged let threat landscape really has changed a lot in the last 20, 25 years. I've been with Beyond Trust for 17 years. Um, I've been in the cybersecurity space for over 25, but about 20 years ago, we really did not worry about credentials on the raised floor, specifically even admin and root. If a couple of users knew the same passwords and credentials for root or the domain administrator, it was kind of like a so what type of thing. If the person left the organization, it really wasn't a big thing either because on that raised floor within that data center, that was the only place that those credentials could be used. So I'm an employee, my peers know the domain admin password, I leave. There also was no urgency to go change it because there was not much he could do with it outside of telling someone else and there was no connectivity to the internet. As crazy as that sounds, that's 20 years ago. That's the year 2000. Most organizations had not connected their data centers to the internet yet. Many organizations were just starting to explore and use email and we were still dealing with things with like Netscape and other types of products at home. And if you think about it, The most popular operating system at the time was Windows 1995 and Windows 98. That's only 20 years ago. 
So we really didn't worry that much about privileged credentials. We knew what they were, we knew there was a risk, but we didn't have all the interconnectivity and internet and sharing and problems that we do today. 10 years ago, we introduced the cloud. We started bringing out SaaS applications and some regions of the world embraced them quicker than others. But we also started to see the proliferation of hypervisors, VMware, VirtualBox, Parallels, all sorts of other virtualization technology, the birth of Citrix, for example. And what this led us is that we could now have virtual machines in the cloud or in our data center or even on our desktops that allowed engineers, developers, all sorts of people to run operating systems within their operating system and with admin privileges. So if the IT community and IT teams were managing your desktop, your server, then you had all these virtual machines out there with administrative rights, those were unmanaged and they became an attack vector. We saw lots of tools and lots of risks uh, targeting hypervisors and people worrying about how to manage all of these virtual machines, whether they were stale, not powered on, not getting patches, it was a problem. And candidly, in many ways, there's still a problem today, but we've gotten past it for the most part. Today, we're seeing that rapid proliferation of IoT and DevOps. Not only at home with the form of personal assistants like Alexa, but all sorts of things from cameras to thermostats to really any type of device that's network created and attached. I mean, if you search Amazon or a variety of other technology type stores, you'll see that even coffee makers and such can be connected to your Wi-Fi. And you ask the question, why? Well, the answer is because you can, and it supposedly provides you a level of convenience. But think about how many of these new technologies you're actually bringing into the office. Everything from smart thermostats to lighting to alarm systems, those are all easy attack vectors. And we should not forget about how easy or how unmanaged they are. If you think about the target breach, the retail breach of target some dozen years ago now, that went after a heating, ventilation, and cooling system. And that was really one of the first ones where an IoT type system connected to a network became an attack vector. And recently in the last two to three years, there was a high publication breach in a casino in the uh, United Kingdom where the aquarium that they had as a part of the casino was connected to the network. So the people monitoring the solidity and the, the care and feeding of the fish and the alkalinity of the water could all be done remotely. Well, the attackers actually attacked that system for monitoring a fish tank remotely and were able to get all the way through the network to the banking system for the casino. So we have to consider the risks that we have with all of these interconnected devices. And you know what? The privileges, not necessarily the vulnerabilities and exploit, the privileges that they have into the environment and who has those username and passwords? Are they default? Can they be abused? Can they be changed? Is there a back door? Because things like the Myriad botnet, only a few years ago, are a perfect example of why IoT and DevOps are such a high risk for privileged attacks. Now in the near future, there are gonna be even more privileged attacks. We see even more SaaS applications coming, at least in the United States, parts of Europe, all of our medical records are online, tons of data. We see all sorts of gaming applications with credit card information, user information that are attackable, so on and so forth. Anything that we're doing in the cloud or in social media or within government or within bill pay that is now in the cloud has privileged accounts, not only for you as a user, but all the administrative work being done in the back end. And to make things a little bit worse with people working from home in this remote work situation due to COVID, we have all of those workers now doing the administration program, software updates as admins and as root operating remotely. And in many cases, VPN technology is outdated or there are other attack vectors that could leverage those privileged accounts. So the attack surface continues to expand and a quick history of where we were 20 years ago to where we are now, a lot has changed and we have to worry about quite a bit. Now I'd like you to first consider the statistic on the right hand side. 77% of critical Microsoft vulnerabilities could be removed, could be mitigated by removing admin rights. 
Beyond Trust every year does an analysis of all of the patches that Microsoft produces. And this statistic comes from it from all the patches in 2019. If you remove admin rights from a workstation, 77% of the critical vulnerabilities, CVE score eight or higher essentially, can be mitigated. That's huge. We ask the first question, why, don't every, why doesn't everybody remove admin rights from end users? And we typically get the answer, it's difficult and users can't do their work, developers can't compile code, et cetera. And the list goes on. But every time an end user has a ministry of access to their local machine or a secondary credential with admin access, it creates an attack vector. What we want to do as a part of this strategy first is consider how big that attack vector is, understand it, but realize that if we remove it, 77% of the attacks against those vulnerabilities basically go away. It gives you time to patch, it gives you time to think about it, it gives you time to react. It's not a permanent solution, but it's a strong mitigation strategy to protecting the endpoint. And we need a way to do that. Now let's consider the statistic all the way on the other side. 80% of breaches involve privileged credentials. This is huge. We just went through the history of privileged accounts, everything from the raised floor to where we are now with modern applications. If 80% of the tax affecting us today are because someone has stolen or obtained administrative or root rights, our best approach is to one, get rid of as many of those accounts or two, protect the credentials in the first place and not worry about the scenarios like I talked about from the raised floor 20 years ago. And if I do things like remove admin rights on the workstations in complement to that 77%, I've got a fairly sound approach to fixing many of the tax that phishing, ransomware, et cetera, use because there are no privileges for them to drop files, to edit the registry, or do something malicious to the system to gain a hold. So the statistics really back up the problem and help us understand where we're going. Now, threat actors today are gaining privileges in a nutshell by these attack vectors, the ones that you see here. It's no longer just sitting in front of a computer like an old movie where I'm gonna guess it's the user's birthday or his dog's name or his wife's name and their anniversary. For the most part, these attacks are much more complex. Rarely guessing works. But you have to think about the attacks that do work, like password spraying and credential stuffing, where you think you have an idea of what a user previously used as a password due to another breach, some data they've obtained from the dark web, and you're going to try every place possible that they may have reused that password. And you know what? They probably did reuse it somewhere, and it might work. You might take the most common passwords, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and start spraying them into every account that you can find the username for in an organization and see if someone foolishly used a simple password or a dictionary-based password to gain access. Those are the types of problems that are occurring all the time. Those are the types of problems we see in the news every single day. A spray attack was used, a credential stuffing attack was used. But ones that really are above and beyond just trying to brute force your way into a password come from things using social engineering phishing attacks, ways of playing on a person, way of making them click on something or answering the form or challenging them with a username and password in an inappropriate or a malicious screen to steal their credentials. It's a great way around uh, two-factor authentication by sending a social email uh, attack against somebody and they click on it and says, oh, you, you, know, you got to enter your username and password to get access to the site and they do and next thing you know, they you've basically bypass their 2FA and you have their credentials for uh, a future attack. Threat actors are getting quite smart. And this list every single year continues to grow with new techniques, new techniques becoming more prominent and different ways of essentially bypassing the confidence of an identity account relationship. In the last five years, simple attacks like simjacking have really come out and been a bigger threat to organizations. And that's the ability to clone a SIM card. Um, in the United States, a few years back, they found what's called a Stingray device, multiple of them scattered throughout Washington, DC, where threat actors, still not disclosed, were picking up on the cell signals from politicians and others in order to clone their phones and listen in on conversations. 
Modern threat actors use that to access everything from your banking applications to email to your two-factor systems. So just keep in mind, threat actors, they're evolving, they're creative, they'll always find a way in, and they're always going to find the simplest way in. And if we make passwords and credentials simple and don't protect them with things like multi-factor authentication, we're making their jobs actually easy to attack an organization. Now, I want to switch gears for a moment. I want to first cover a traditional password management approach. Now, when we talk about privileged access management, the first thing that comes to most users' minds is password management or putting passwords in a vault. That was pretty much true 10, 15 years ago. Putting passwords in a vault for the most sensitive systems, having someone go in, check it out, copy it to a pasteboard, paste it in an application, and then let it rotate at another time or after that session is old school technology. It only covers two attack vectors, the most sensitive servers and the most sensitive resources, let's say for compliancy. It does not protect you against really what you use from an organization into the cloud. It doesn't protect you from any DevOps or automation. It certainly doesn't protect you from mobile devices and next gen tech as we talked about for IoT and definitely, absolutely definitely does not do well with remote workers because a remote worker going to a safe is now exposing that credential all the way across the wire in potentially their home, which really is a bad idea. So we have to think of how are we gonna protect against privileged attacks more than just putting passwords in a safe. We need to be able to take that to a different approach and think about how do we remove admin rights or make those admin rights obfuscated, which means hidden or abstracted in those situations that they could be used as an attack vector. Anytime that you may have them hard coded in a script or they may be included in another program for some part of automation or the program has a connector where you type in a username and password so it can feed to another resource. All of those places need a way to get rid of those privileged accounts. We have to consider all of the place workstations have privileged accounts, whether they're service accounts used for log management, antivirus, or some other tools, or even an application. We don't want local, ad, uh, local systems workstations to have administrative privileges. Look, we've already determined 77% of Microsoft critical vulnerabilities can be mitigated by removing them, so why are we using them? We need a strategy, a privileged attack strategy to removing them. We also have to consider mobile devices and next-gen tech. That's everything that would be smart in our environment and smart connected to the network. They don't have the same passwords. They're properly segmented, access is controlled, etc. Especially in the case of um, uh, critical infrastructure and manufacturing environments where those devices may not get security patches for a considerable amount of time. We need to make sure that any time a privileged account is out there, um, it's controlled. And then finally, with what we're dealing with today, all the remote workers. All those people like you and I today, working from potentially home and accessing resources in the cloud or on premise and typing in a username and password that could be privileged outside of the organization. Now, if your business does work in the United States or in Europe as well, there are plenty of regulations that are now looking at how remote workers are accessing sensitive data remotely and using privileges because the privacy laws for those countries and regions dictate that you have to have zoning and controlling and segmentation and auditing of wherever they were used and whenever that sensitive data was viewed. With people now working from home, that's quite difficult. And again, if they're using privileged attacks, even more complex. So our privileged attack strategy has got to consider all of these pieces and not just passwords in a vault anymore. So let's take this from the theoretical approach now. Let's consider the cyber attack chain. We have two types of attacks. We have the insider threat, where it's a person who's intentionally doing something malicious and attacking and stealing information. Realistically, that's less than 17% of all attacks. It's still a significant number, but most of the attacks are not a malicious insider stealing something. The bulk of the attacks are external. A threat actor somewhere in the world attacking the cloud, phishing attacks, ransomware attacks, etc., trying to get into your organization. But there is a gray line. The insider that has been compromised that doesn't know they're being used 
as a part of the attack. Malware has been put on their system or some other type of uh, keylogger or something else so that they become what we call a mule. They're basically a conduit for the attack. Now, regardless of the attack vector itself, the threat actor's next mission is to get those privileges. Because as a standard user or just basically low level privileges, they don't have access to anything sensitive in the company. They don't. They can't necessarily install software. If they try to do something too abruptly, threat detection, antivirus or other solutions might kick off saying, hey, something is wrong. So they have to be very careful. But what they wanna do is get privileges. These can occur with all of the techniques that I listed before. They may already know the admin password to a server. They may already know it, but they have no way of logging into it remotely. They're basically using the external threat to get to a server where they can then use those credentials and then see the data or through that insight. But the goal for a threat actor is to get admin or root or something similar to that and continue to move around the environment undetected, probing for additional opportunities until they can steal the information they want, they can install more malware, they can place ransomware in a sensitive system or even cause a denial of service or some critical disruption. Now, the critical disruption piece is quite interesting. About 15 years ago, the United States government, the Department of Energy did something called Project Aurora. If you, if you would like, please look at it on the internet. I did a paper on that about 15 years ago. And what they did was they took a diesel generator and basically put it on the internet and said, hack it because they didn't really know if someone hacking through the internet could cause a generator to you know, have problems. It was theory that it could. Within about seven minutes, a threat actor got in and what they did was quite amusing. Instead of trying to compromise the controller for the generator, they actually told the computer to turn off the cooling valve. That's all they did. So the generator kept on running, heated up, and it literally eventually exploded. That's what they did. They used privileged credentials to get in through a vulnerability exploit combination. They moved laterally through the control system to find their goal. They found a low level system, basically a thermostat and said, don't ever open, keep the cooling water shut. The generator overheated and exploded. Now privileged attack vectors is not just about stealing data. It could be any type of privileged attack affecting your infrastructure, your data, your systems, et cetera. But once you know that elevated privileged state, administrator or root, any type of subsequent attack or threat is fair game to that threat actor. With the ones basically hitting the news or things like a generator blowing up, even though it was theoretical, or a massive data breach. And what we need to do is look at that attack chain, even from that theoretical example, and say, where can I place monitoring solutions or changes in process to actually stop it? And the orange bees for Beyond Trust are places where you can think about those transitions and actually work with the technology to solve it. Now, let's understand a bigger picture here. Why is this a problem within our companies? What are the top three privileged use cases that almost every business in some form or another is experiencing contributing to these threats? The first is employees, vendors, and others have excessive rights. We typically just give people admin rights on their local system or make them a part of the admin group because it's convenient. And you know what? They can just get the job done. It's so much easier to just put someone in the local admin group of their workstation and let them work than to do least privilege, remove admin rights and assign exactly what they need. That's actually quite difficult. And it normally results in quite a bit of support calls with, I tried to add a printer, it didn't let me. I tried to run an updater, it didn't let me. I tried to change the system clock because it's off five minutes and it didn't let me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we typically just give too much admin rights. And that can be to the end user, it could be to a server, it could be to an administrator, it could be to a vendor, and it can be to any type of automation. If we're developing software in a CICD, continuous integration, continuous development and an agile approach, we generally just give the scripts admin rights so that they work, so that they can fulfill their function. We don't think about what is the minimum amount of privileges to give them so that they can't be abused. Now, the statistics below really pretty much back this up. 
If you think about it from a vendor perspective, 182 vendors log into an average organization, a large average business, medium to enterprise every single week. Go back to that target example that I used earlier. Granted that's old, but 182 times a vendor may come in to check how much printer ink is in your printers, may check your air conditioning system, your cameras, may be doing order processing, may do all of it. It's a huge amount. Why are we giving them admin rights? We give too many people admin rights. And when those credentials are stolen, it leads to the attack vectors we're talking about. So we have to think of a way of getting rid of those admin rights and most importantly, monitoring all of their access to make sure it's appropriate. Now, the second goes back to our history lesson. Credentials are shared and unmanaged. Think about this real and simple. How many passwords or how many locations do you use more than one, uh, use the same password in more than one location? Yeah, I'm raising my hand. I'm not perfect. I have a, a methodology that I use myself. You're welcome to ping me afterwards. But I do not know all the 150 plus sites, individual passwords. Now I use a password manager like many people should, security best practice, but there are some really basic sites that I just use the same password. Why? They're very low risk. It's to reading the newspaper. There's really nothing behind it. There's not even a credit card behind it. But the point here is, is some people don't take it to that well of an extreme and think about it in that way. They reuse the passwords in a lot of places and then they start sharing them and then they become unmanaged. Domain administrative passwords, how many people know them? How many people know your social media passwords? Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, for the business, those are all shared. That's a really bad idea because if anybody gets a hold of them, the amount of embarrassment and trouble they can cause for you on social media is enormous. Think about the Bitcoin problem that happened to Twitter just a few weeks ago. And we're not managing them. We don't rotate them. We don't secure them. We have not necessarily a way to put complexity around them. As soon as we start deviating from the model of a single person with a single account and a single password, we create this problem. And that's why it's number two. Every user should have any number of accounts needed to do their job, hopefully as minimal as possible, and unique passwords with nothing ever shared internally and never the same passwords that they use at home. Never. 34% of users share their passwords with coworkers. It's huge. That's over one third of the business people know each other's passwords. And over 60% of the cost companies that are out there today have over a thousand stale user accounts. When I say stale, I'm referring to accounts from employees that have left the organization, shadow IT, been added for a vendor and the vendor is not there anymore or some other type of problem. This just complements my argument here that is the second highest use case credentials are shared and unmanaged and we need to do a better job. Now let's think about the third one. IT assets communicate unchecked. This is a little bit more technical, especially when we consider workers working from home. But let's start with it at the office. Two workstations sitting on the same network, on the same floor, should never talk to each other. There's no reason, absolutely no reason. Not even Windows Update, even by default, should be allowed to share those two machines. Why? That's how ransomware spreads. That's how lateral movement occurs. They should actually be blocked from each other. Now, working from home, we should only be allowing the proper networks and applications to come into the network, not be able to see other networks that are other users that are connecting through a VPN or other remote access technology as well. This is how malware and attack th threat actors essentially work. They're communicating unchecked through resources that normally should not be talking to each other, infecting them and finding a way to the sensitive systems that they want to get to. 70% of all attacks involve lateral movement. Let's stop, let's start reusing our firewalls and our communication protocols in the right way and say, look, on the local network, you can't talk to each other. If you want to print something, it should go through the print server. 
I should not be able to do a share and talk to the machine next to me. I should be putting all my files in a central server that's approved. It's one of the biggest pattern abuse problems in all of the organizations we work with. Assets working together should only talk to the resources that are appropriate and never with each other laterally. When we think about privileged attack vectors, if you have an admin account on one, it can then talk to the next and keep on infecting and infecting. They should never even be able to talk to each other. And in fact, if you take it to the extreme, the privileged accounts on one system should not be valid anyplace else. Those are the top three use cases. So now let's take a proper definition of privileged access management. Many people, as I've indicated, think of privileged access management as that passwords in a vault approach. And that's only one component. But privileged access management is a subcomponent of identity governance. This model done by the IDSA Alliance basically highlights its placement. We have on the network client devices, applications, compute, and we consider things like zero trust architectures and just in time as a part of the methodology for users and humans and bots and applications to get access to resources and then data. When we consider that as a part of the identity stack, you have access management, privilege access management as we're talking about, directory services and identity governance. That's all of the identity models in an identity governance program. And you may choose one vendor for access management and another for identity governance. It's okay. But the key here is, is they should integrate. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But from a context, risk and policy workflow to solve the challenges we talked about, we need to think of things like DLP because we don't want sensitive data to egress across machines that it's not allowed, they should not be allowed. We should think of things like the software defined perimeter because with people working from home, we need to have security at layers all the way out and not just our traditional firewall. A high level identity governance puts PAM in the middle. And what makes it more complex is that privilege access management is more than just that password management or putting passwords in a vault. It includes things like inventory and discovery, being able to find all of those privileged accounts, whether they're local to a system, whether they're on a domain, whether they're in scripts, whether they're within an application, what additional ones may have been added to infrastructure, et cetera. Security Basics 101 tells us that if you can't inventory an environment, you can't properly manage it or apply security disciplines. Knowing where your privileged accounts are that could be abused as a part of these attack vectors is no different. So you have to really find them all and be able to say, is it a risk and should I manage it? Now you also have to consider that once, <clears throat> excuse me, once you discover all of them, what are you gonna do with them? Are you gonna place them in management? Are you gonna write standard operating procedures around their usage? Are you gonna allow a user to check them out and potentially copy them to a clipboard or paste them? Are you gonna do things like auto inject them into an application so they're obfuscated? The end user actually never sees the username and password, et cetera. That's fairly traditional password management, but it goes further because session management includes the recording and the transcription of what the end user actually did used and saw on the system. Look, if you're just checking out a password, you have no idea if their access was appropriate. You have no idea if they ran a command to dump a database or look at sensitive information. So you actually have to monitor the commands they're doing and what they see on the screen at the same time to determine if it's appropriate. And even more so when they're working remotely so that you can manage those governance problems of, yep, he did access that system and he was able to see that data but we can prove nothing was copied out so that there is no liability to a potential abuse problem. Now, all of these have to have privilege management all the way on the right. This is the removal of admin rights on Windows, Unix, Linux, Mac, network devices. We do not want to create any more admin accounts than absolutely necessary. In fact, we want to remove all of the excessive ones. We do not want to give users X admin. We do not want those back doors for the help desk. We want to get rid of them all, but still allow the end user to be productive. That's critical as a part of privileged access management and a part of this definition. Because if no one has admin rights, but programs still execute, all of the scenarios that we talked about before and the attack vectors 
go away. Critical vulnerabilities, you can't have lateral movement because there's no admin rights, et cetera, et cetera. And then properly on top of that, you have to have all the system integration so it lives as a part of your ecosystem. You have to have reporting and extensive governance to tell you what was used, when it was used, how it was used, and even prove that this entire strategy is more effective than for the business and less of a risk than actually giving out all those secondary admin accounts. That's the definition of privileged access management. It is so much more than just passwords and involved. It includes all of the remote access techniques and all the removal and session monitoring that we're speaking about because that's how attacks are occurring today and threat actors are not sitting like in a movie in front of your keyboard anymore. They're not. They're doing it through remote access and they need privileges to do it. So let's get rid of those privileges to make sure that those systems are protected. So now let's dig into the 10 steps. What are the 10 steps to universal privilege management? And per universal privilege management is the expansion of privilege access management as a function of a journey. Now notice these 10 steps as a journey, they do not have a starting place, they do not have an ending place, and there's no order or arrows telling you which way to go. In fact, based on your problems, your business and risk problems, you start wherever you want. You then pick up the next step in the journey to satisfy your next problem and continue to move on. So if you have problems where I don't know where all my privileged accounts are, or everybody is an admin on their desktops, or I'm moving everything to the cloud but I can't control access, you choose that as your order. This is critical. You solve the problems that are unique to your business for privileged attack vectors and you're building your defensive strategy versus being told you've got to do X, Y, and Z first before you can get to Z. So in no particular order, we're just going to go around the circle. Let's talk about each 10. The first is accountability for privileged attacks. This goes down that discovery route that I talked about earlier. If you cannot discover and manage what you have out there, you will never be successful. It'll always be that one account no one knew about, and that becomes the way the threat actor got into the environment and breached your data. You want to consider when you want to rotate passwords and when you want to rotate keys and certificates, because it could be done after every session, it could be done every six months, and there may be cases where you can't rotate them. There are older applications where once you set the password, it can never be changed. You know what? You have to isolate those, store them in the system, and then obfuscate them from all future use. It just happens that way. Any place that someone's hard coding a password in an application or in a script, those need to get, be taken away. Those need to be substituted for API keys or made in, uh, excuse me, need to be taken away and substituted for a RESTful API query in order to replace those passwords. Enforcing segmentation goes without further conversation. We've beaten this one up pretty hard. Systems should not be talking inappropriately laterally. Therefore, from the discovery, can two privileged accounts be used in two places that would talk laterally? And ultimately, anytime privileged accounts are being used, you need to monitor for user behavior. You need to prove that people are doing the appropriate things and that out of band things are not occurring. Now, one of the most effective things as a part of universal privilege management and our journey is to remove admin rights on the end users, on the desktops. We're giving you the statistics. We also want to eliminate a user having multiple administrative accounts. If you have to give them one, only give them one, but make sure it works everywhere. And this is really, really simple to understand. When you have to do a report to say, this person did all of this privileged activity and they have dozens of accounts with privileged activity, you have to manually correlate that data together. That's a problem, that's difficult. But if you can give them one and it works on Unix, it works on Linux, it works on Windows, then when you have to produce that report, it's really easy. You know the person's identity, you know their admin account, and you know it works everywhere. Remove them, right? Remove all the unnecessary ones, but if you have to have it, condense it. Implement context-aware rules. If the program is running from within the organization, it can get these privileges. If it's running from home, these privileges. But you know what? If you notice it being run outside of your own country, 
on an application, on an operating system that you don't support, deny it, send an alert. These are not hard things to do, but will help make sure that a threat actor does not compromise a privileged account because you're verifying based on attributes, this is a sanctioned system that's supposed to be used with my systems. Don't forget multi-factor authentication. It's not perfect. All it does is give you a better confidence over a traditional username and password. It can be hacked, but it's hard. It gives you a higher confidence that the identity of the person is who they say they are versus someone just stealing a username and password. Keep in mind, it's not a perfect solution. I can only say that enough times. I know that from personal experience. It helps, but it's not perfect. It's a good mitigation strategy when you have to remove admin rights and prove with a better confidence the person is who they say they are. When you do use admin rights, monitor everything. Make sure you're collecting as much log information as you can. You're centralizing that in a SIM or some other tool set because if there is an attack, you're gonna to wanna to figure out how, where, what, when, why, who, etc. Log information is gonna provide you that. So remove admin rights from the desktops, elevate the application, not the user, then you'll be quite effective. Now this is true on servers as well. How many people know admin right access to servers? A lot. How many of them have unique credentials for a server? A lot. This goes to what I was just speaking about. There are techniques and products that allow you to log into Linux using a Kerberos ticket based on an AD credential. It helps you essentially control who has access. But you need granular access. You don't want to give out sudo to everyone. You, you don't want them using it. You want to control that they can run this command, but not that, but without these switches. And you need it to be reliable, and you need to see all the output. Therefore, you can control if someone tries to run a database dump to look at sensitive data versus a reboot or install software, or someone coming in just to run yum or do some other type of patch update. Make sure you remove admin rights from all servers and delegate it out with a system that controls exactly what they can run and how they can run it. Now, application reputation is relatively newer in the industry. It goes also by the term application control. It was originally pioneered by other vendors using hashes to control which applications can run and which ones can't, but that's actually a maintenance nightmare. So what we want to do with application, uh, application uh, reputation is control allow lists and blacklists and gray listing for known systems based on digital signatures, where they're downloaded from, and even comparing them things to like virus total to prove that they're not malware before allowing them to operate. It's a smarter way to do application control because you may say, I'm going to allow Hewlett Packard HP printer drivers to install on a home user systems, but no other software from HP will I allow to run. I may allow programs downloaded from this application store, but from nowhere else. But if I have the same two on the system, even compared by hash to the same, if one was downloaded from a place I don't trust, but this one was, I'll only allow this one to run. It's getting fine grain control on application reputation and then assigning the privileges to them. So you know exactly what's running on the box and with what privileges. Now, remote access. Everyone's doing remote access. We're remote workers for the remote part. We also talked about all those vendors and everyone else doing remote access. Every remote access session is some form of privileged remote access session because you're giving privileges to essentially log in remotely, right? Truth. So how do we control those credentials? How do we not give them to somebody in an email or a text message? How do we auto inject them? And how do we do them without the need for even VPN technology? So if I need a vendor to come in with this level of privileges or an employee or anybody else, they just get to the systems they need and they don't know anything else about the username and passwords. And I'm even recording everything and documenting everything that they do. When we talk about all those attack vectors coming in from the outside, most of those are using native protocols, SSH, RDP, something not patched. We found out the username and password. It was hanging out there from a previous breach. Use a dedicated remote access technology that mitigates every one of those risks and then document and record all the usage, including auto-injecting the credentials so the end user doesn't know it. Now, if your organization is going more advanced in technology, 
you're experiencing that curve of adding more IoT based on what you do, whether it's cash registers, whether it's fire alarms, or even better network infrastructure, do that same concept of discovery and onboard all of those devices. In fact, make sure that all, every single one of those devices, every camera, every cash register has a unique password that you store in that traditional password management solution. There would be nothing worse than having all of these point of sale systems, all of these cash registers with the same password, one is compromised and the threat actor basically owning every one of them with malware to scrape off every credit card transaction. You know what? It's happened all over the world. And if you look at any of the breaches for major hotels, that's been the way that they've done it. Keep each one unique, keep each one managed and store them in an individual vault. But more importantly, you still got to discover them. And that's also true for network devices, routers, switch, core uh, key fobs for doors, et cetera. Now the cloud and virtualization, as we've indicated based on our history lesson, is just as important and just as much of a problem. With all of the virtual machines your organization is running in a private cloud or an end user's desktops, you need to keep them managed. This has a little bit further of a reach than privileged access management in our discussion today. You need to consider using templates and not letting people spin up their own virtual machines. But once they do, make sure that the management of those privileged credentials is also considered. And remove admin rights and use least privilege using technology in order to implement them better. For cloud resources and SaaS applications, we're talking the same thing. All SaaS-based cloud applications should be gated their credentials stored, and the end users that are assigned to them never have them directly. In fact, you should gate all of that access through a single point so that it does not become a liability to the business too. This can be done with single sign-on solutions or with privileged access management as well. If your organization is embracing DevOps and secure DevOps, think about all of the automation that you're putting in place from compiling code to deploying code to QA, where are all the credentials used in that automation? How are you making sure that none of those get abused and that they're changed? And in fact, they're not available when you're not publishing code. If you notice or keep up with current trends in terms of hackers and malware, getting into the pipeline for development, code development, is one of the premier techniques for Android attacks. A hacker will get into an organization, insert the malware into their development stream. It goes all the way through dev QA, gets published in the Android store, and then there's a little piece of code sitting in the background doing something malicious. And the vendor didn't even know it. Because as a part of that automation pipeline, those usernames and passwords or the certificates were never changed. They were available off hours. No one was monitoring their usage. And the hacker got into the build servers or something like that to potentially do something malicious. If you are embracing automation with DevOps, et cetera, make those credentials only available when you need to, just in time, and more appropriately, don't hard code them. Now, privileged account integration into other tools is key. When I started the presentation, I indicated I'm also the CISO. I handle the security for my own organization as well as our solutions handled in the cloud. And I have one thing that I tell my team all the time. If we're gonna go buy any product, any security product, tell me all the places that it integrates with. Because if I buy a security solution that does not integrate with anything else, but it solves a problem, that security product's life is short-lived. It solves a problem for that time, that place. It doesn't provide me any other value in terms of integration or my ecosystem. I need it to integrate into my ticketing system. I need it to integrate into my SIM. I need it to be context aware for my two-factor system, et cetera. Buying a tool to solve one problem and only that one problem is a bad idea. So when you look at universal privilege management and privileged access management tools, ask where else does it integrate? Can I leverage my ServiceNow instance? Can I integrate into products like BMC or Cherwell? Can I forward the data to my SIM, et cetera? because that all provides value for everything we've talked about in order to detect events and understand the risk that we really face. And then finally, if you've matured to the point of using a dedicated identity governance solution where you're managing identities on premise or in the cloud, the role-based access controls to control all privileges is key. If someone's an admin and they're placed in that admin group, 
you can assign all the privileges through the all other nine steps that we talked about from here. You don't have to do it at another layer and another tool. You can do it using role assignments for IT or business from those tools. And that's key. So I want to first now touch on Beyond Trust Universal Privilege Management really quickly, and then we're going to open it up to some questions. Universal Privilege Management has been pioneered by Beyond Trust, and we are a market leader according to all of the analysts. We have an integrated platform to solve all 10 steps in this journey that I've talked to you about and all of the different use cases. We have over 20,000 clients worldwide, an exceptional renewal rate and customer satisfaction, and over 75 patents in our portfolio to back up this technology. We do this in the form of privileged access management, using a password management strategy to check in, check out passwords in that traditional context with rotation and session monitoring, endpoint privilege management, which enables the removal of admin rights on Windows, Unix, Linux, and Mac, and allow you to just make programs work as administrators without ever giving the end user administrative rights. Secure remote access for the help desk and those remote employees, all tied together with our Beyond Insight platform, available on-premise or on the cloud to meet your current demands. Thank you very much, and I'll open it up to Q&A from the team. Appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Maury. <clears throat> that was uh, very, very interesting. I appreciate that, uh, that information. <clears throat> One of the things that I liked, and I want to make sure that you can hear me okay? I can. Okay, good. One of the questions that I had is about the, uh, the, the journey model. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. And, um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of my clients, they, they use different vendors, right? Everyone uses multiple vendors for the solution. So I've seen them, some of the vendors that they use um, do cover some of those steps shown in the journey. Um, do I need to tell them to replace them, you know, with, with Beyond Trust or, or can Beyond Trust be incorporated into that already established solutions that they have in place? That's a great question. Um, many organizations have embraced various steps along that journey from putting passwords in a vault to uh, DevOps solutions in the cloud for securing secrets. The Beyond Trust philosophy or this 10-step universal privilege management journey does not require um, Beyond Trust products. It is a theoretical approach. It's actually covered in the second edition of my book that I mentioned in the um, beginning of the presentation. But more importantly, if you choose to remove admin rights, let's say on desktops or servers or remote access, you can use a Beyond Trust technology and it has built-in connectors to many of the leading third-party vendors. So even my competitors, we integrate with to be able to continue down that journey approach. So we match theory with product so that you can use whatever you would like. Excellent, excellent. And and so, yeah, so that was my next question about your, your books, right? The um, the difference between privileged attack vectors, uh, the first edition and the, and the second edition. Certainly. And so, yeah, if, if you've gone on Amazon or Springer, which is the publisher, um, the first edition was written over three years ago. And as I kind of illustrated in some of the talk, the threat landscape changes drastically year after year. Oh, yeah. And then in the three years, things like simjacking and uh, other attack vectors have occurred. So the second edition actually goes from 12 steps down to 10 due to condensed uh, technologies and theory. Um, has over 100 new pages in the book, and over 40% of the book was rewritten. So if you happen to have seen uh, the previous edition, the new one uh, is just basically a straightforward update to what we see in the world today. Yeah, because in the uh, uh, first presentation that we had today from Krishna, the founder at Netscape, he was mentioning right uh, how attack vectors continue to evolve. And so we need to continue developing our, our defensive mechanisms. Uh, we can't just live in the past. So that's, uh, that, that's a great point. It is. And, uh, you know, uh, as my, my CEO pings on me once in a while, are you going to do another one? I'm like, let me wait another year. Four months <laughs> in five years is enough. It's, it's okay. Yeah. And um, can any of oh, the, the last question that I have is, can any of this technology replace my current bastion host or VPN vendors, especially now, right, with, with that we're moving to 
I mean, everything, everyone has moved to COVID, you know, because of COVID, implemented a whole bunch of VPNs. Maybe they have multiple VPN vendors. So how does this technology, uh, will it use or can it, can it use to be replaced to replace those technologies? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, what we've seen some vendors, some clients do is where they have heavy investments in bastion host technologies like Citrix or Microsoft RDS or yeah. VMware VDI technology, use those funds for privileged remote access technology because it can do so much more than that. In addition, good privileged remote access technology can also do protocol tunneling like VPN, but it can also do web proxy. It can also do a zero trust architecture. There's a lot of additional benefits. So depending on your use case, if you're looking for funds or you know you need to upgrade your VPN or you're paying too much for those legacy virtual desktop technologies, Many of the privileged technologies that I just spoke about are next generation or more intelligent, cost less and more secure than those legacy approaches. So yes, yeah. they could be used as a replacement. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Maury, I appreciate your time. Uh, I, I thought this presentation was fantastic. It was basic, straight to the point and, and very clear, but at the same time was, was you know, very, um, actualized, right? Uh, it, it fits today's environment. Thank so uh, really, really appreciate that. If we can get control back of the uh, screen, we appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And uh, everyone and uh, hope you have a great week. Great. Thank you so much, Maury. Okay. Bye. Thanks.